thank you so gracious. All right, so as, as we said, my name is Victoria Sabo. Um, my partner, Cosmo Monteleone, is not here, but he is an equal partner in our work. No? Next one. Ah, okay, so just a, a quick background about us. Normally, we work together in digital cultural heritage applications. Uh, we've worked together for many years on a collaboration called Visualizing Venice, which is now called Visualizing Cities, and participate in a lab called Digital Art History and Visual Culture at Duke University. We most recently ran an institute at Venice International University entitled Exhibiting Hidden Histories, Bringing Art History Projects to Publics Through Digital Exhibitions and XR, all of which is to say that there's a larger context of trying to think about how to use new media technologies in these kinds of applications. However, this project is a bit of a side project and a diversion and a publication for us. Um, our background is that one of the projects we did together um, in Venice was about the history of the Venetian ghetto. And we became very intrigued by location-based applications that would bring exhibition elements to life in lived experience in the city. And so what you see here are some ideas of how we brought in some of the content from the exhibition into the physical space. And one of the fundamental principles we were really interested in was how to represent the presence of the past of lived experience in the space. And so you see on the right, there's three different stages of one particular location in the ghetto where we showed uh, the current situation, uh, a sort of ghostly presence of the past situation, and then a more immersive version of the past using only the data for which we had some actual knowledge, and then otherwise creating some blanks. So it's an idea of responsibly trying to recreate the past and create a lived experience on site. So this sort of project, of course, demands uh, scholarly fidelity and uh, strict attention to uh, correspondences between what we can prove and what we show. However, the project that we're doing together as a side project on uh, H.P. Lovecraft's Providence is more about speculation and imagination and combining scholarly and historical research with something a little bit more imaginative. Those of you um, who've read H.P. Lovecraft's work know that he's an early 20th century U.S. writer who wrote uh, horror tales and uh, tales of tension, uh, sort of early science fiction. Um, and he set a lot of his works in the city of Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, he had a deep engagement with the history of that city and its architecture, and it manifested very much in the writing that he did. So part of what we wanted to do together, coming from our own perspectives, was to think about how we visualize a literary space that is based on a real place in imaginative ways, taking advantage of the affordances of various new media technologies in order to, to do this work. Um, we're also interested in this topic of hidden, vanished, and counterfactual and obscured past, as I said, through our more scholarly institute, but here allowing to be liberated a little bit more to experiment with possibilities. Um, we're thinking about fictive places very much as an opportunity for creative exploration and uh, critical fabulation. Um, and then also thinking about how we can take these approaches back into our own teaching, in my case, in digital art history and visual culture, in his case, in architectural engineering. So as we uh, encounter this project, part of what's interesting is that there's two different strains of work that's already been done around Lovecraft. One is historical research done by scholars, um, and then also what we as scholars will do in order to find out more about his sources. But then there's also this massive industry of enthusiasts, people who are very interested on a fan level in thinking about the places and spaces of Lovecraft. So we have very much a head start. Um, there's all these guides that you could use for walking tours, et cetera, in uh, Providence. The first case study is uh, the case of Charles Dexter Ward. This is a story about a young man who discovers his necromancer ancestor um, and wants to reproduce the, uh, the power and authority of this uh, dangerous person. Uh, there are many scenes that take place in Providence that we have been able to retrace. Um, one of the interesting things about this as a case study example for us is that it operates at numerous uh, points of scale. So anything from buildings and rooms to city and neighborhoods to regions to worlds as well as interior states. So each of these offers challenges to us for thinking about how to visualize literary places and spaces at a, at a different level and with different degrees of evidence. There's also voices and perspectives that come out of the different characters in the tale. We don't have time to talk about this now, but this is in feeding into how we're presenting in the final application. Uh, if we look at the overview of the tale, we get a sense of overlapping timelines and spaces and the possibility, if you're trying to think about how to do an adaptation that prioritizes 
space and experience how we might layer the different elements into the environment that we create. So some of what we did in thinking about how to pr proceed with this project was to explore different modes of new media interaction, to think about what they might correspond to, to think about what interactor experiences might take place, and then to think about possible methodologies for enacting them. And again, in digital art history and visual culture, we tend to use things like you know, GIS, um, interactive time-based media, video, uh, game engines, 3D modeling, uh, different types of uh, installations. So what we decided to do for this first project was really inspired by the uh, Venetian Ghetto Project that I mentioned earlier. It's a locative on-site experience in the city of Providence itself, and you can see some initial points that we have here. And I'm just going to go briefly through some of the different points that we've identified to illustrate the ways in which we've tried to bring to life this concept. Uh, and in so doing, we're trying to think about something that can be experienced both on site in the city and also something that could be experienced online if you're not actually physically there. And for that, we're doing some 360 photography and then embedding it in a map and layering in different media elements. So uh, the first location at the asylum is really foregrounding the place that the story begins. We happen to know that the mental institution where the main character um, is, in, is incarcerated uh, is a, based on a real place, and so this is a starting point for a lived experience. The maps that we use are historical to the early 20th century, which is when the tale is told and set. This case is a fire insurance map in this case. Um, and then part of what we're trying to think about is how to evoke different elements of the story. One critical element is that this primary character uh, as a youth wanders around the city having all of these uh, sort of romantic experiences of the place. And so we want to reproduce a little bit of a sense of that in the experience of the user who's walking around the city appreciating the sites as they are now but also the past. And then having the opportunity but not the necessity to look at the text or to listen to the text itself in that moment. So we hope that people who are interacting might be enthusiasts who already know the tale and want to sort of rediscover it in a new way, or others who just want to have the experience on its own without the necessity of understanding already the story in advance. Yeah. Um, there's also this other element. Um, I mentioned that the main character has this ancestor who he discovers and who gradually comes to possess him. And so we were able to delve also into the 1600s, 1700s, and beyond uh, in the history of Providence. So this allows us to take our experience with layering of maps in GIS and apply it to a map, but in a creative way. And so we've been able to do things like rediscover some of the sites of elements of the text and provide a way for you to access them potentially online. There's elements like um, the history of the slave trade in Providence that are foregrounded when we start looking into this earlier historic period and which also enables us to think about how Lovecraft himself was engaged with some troubling pasts in his city. Yeah. yeah. Um, so another key location is one where this magical portrait emerges and we'll think creatively about doing that. Um, there's also the strong concept of the library. So in addition to the locative experience in the site, we want to have an opportunity to have a place where you can go and you can explore in more detail. We're using the idea of the library as a jumping off point for various other types of modalities, including uh, looking into the occult travels of the characters uh, that take, bring the tale from the interior space of an exterior space of the library and into the wider world. This is also an opportunity for a sort of tour de force GIS experience. Um, and then also this idea of the necromantic library for which we've been doing research into some of the texts that uh, are some of the references that Lovecraft made. One particular one we're very intrigued by is this idea of jars of ash, cremation ash, that were used in, a, in this case, they're shown in a mental hospital, but which are used in the necromantic rites. So trying to think creatively about images from the contemporaneous period and in that mental institutions, and then applying that to the 3D models that we're creating. Uh, a graveyard, of course, is another key locale. Um, and that graveyard will enable us to portal into a sort of more immersive aspect. So part of the experience of working through the space is that you're uh, in the exterior and then going deeper and deeper into the story. As you go deeper, you're going also into more immersive 3D environments. Um, there's a 3D space that is a kind of culminating environment um, that you'll be able to look in, look around, and move in. Um, the space is revealed over time in the text, and so it will also be revealed over time to the user. And then part of what we're also hoping to do is think about how we can make a fully immersive experience that you can walk into. 
also in the cemetery. If we can find an appropriate place where nobody will get hurt, um, we can imagine our users being able to actually walk into the environment and then interact with some of the media that we're providing. This is also the culminating moment of the tale when there's the banishment of the, uh, the evil shade of, of the ancestor. And then uh, finally, there'll be the dissolution of that character. And then the last thing I want to say is that this is just one of several tales that we're working on. We uh, are also doing a different project about um, Innsmouth, which is an imagined environment, but not one that's actually based on a physical location. And here we're foregrounding architectural elements and a game engine based environment. This is a thesis student working with us on this. And what he's done is a similar path of uh, taking uh, primary source materials and adapting them, but then also doing a survey of architectural forms uh, with an eye towards thinking about constructing an immersive environment that we can work in. And he'll be coming to uh, Duke University in the fall to work on this. I will continue to develop the narrative elements, and then we'll have some of our own students developing this out with the goal of having an environment that overlays multiple tales um, so that you can revisit again and again, not just the elements of one tale or the other, but all of them on top of each other in a spatialized fashion. Thank you. Thank you.